She hated men all her life, and then she went and married one. How ironic. This is an example of everyday and low level or cocktail party irony. It's not what the world of art means by irony, but there is a significant connection between the two. In this talk, we will say what irony is and tell the strange story of how the species Homo sapiens came to stand on stages and pretended to be other than itself, hatching and executing plots and using language design to bend the truth or deceive outright, all apparently undertaken with the intention of shining an educational light on how a predator thinks, speaks and behaves in the unnatural environment of civilized life. This talk was first given on the 24th of April 2013 and is being given today on the 29th of January 2019. What is irony? In what circumstances did the Greeks discover it? A biophysical view. Introduction. The argument of this talk is that drama, that phenomenon which involves stage performances, audiences, actors, plotters, and the plotted against, is a type of dissociative reaction born of a large number of human predators trying, quite against their natural inclinations, to live together in a civilization. In the dramatic production, many issues to do with, quotes, the game of predation are analyzed. The issues revolve around the ideas of who's getting the better of whom and what the ones who are being gotten the better of are doing about it. In its biological essence, the issues are two in number. One, you can predate on someone, and if that goes well, your life chances will improve. And two, someone else can predate on you, and that will be a depreciative disaster, and will see your life chances diminish. Irony, we propose, is the core element in the dissociative reaction. The ironist on the stage is the dissociated entity, a simulacrum, someone who quotes, looks the part, a plausible form. Meanwhile, inches away, the audience is in on the game. They are the devotees of irony. There is a complicity and co-identification between the person in the audience and the plotter on the stage. No matter who the plotter is, no matter how evil they are, or how good they are, the audience are monitoring and calibrating the plausibilities. In irony, understanding the game is all, which is to say the evolutionary point of the exercise, so the first and principal goal of this talk is to explain the idea of ironist as dissociated entity and predator. But there is a second goal, one that deals with an historical clarification. In the clarification, we will show that irony gave birth, not just to drama, but also to those three other strange children, democracy, rhetoric, and skeptical philosophy. Irony, in short, we are contending, gave us ancient Greece, and eventually the whole concept of the West. Part one, what is irony? Here's my definition of irony. Irony is the intuition that a form might be empty. With this definition, let me first draw your attention to the words might be, not is. If it were is, that would be the intuition of a psychopath or of an autistic person. People who we are continually told don't get human conventions. They don't get the time-sanctioned political, religious or social forms of the world they live in. They don't get them because psychopaths don't seem to be able to care, and autistics have trouble imagining anybody's mental events outside of their own. But psychopaths and autistics constitute only a little over 1% of the population. 
For the rest of us, let's say the 99%, this obliviousness with regards to contents in forms is not available. Unlike the psychopaths and autistics, we live in two worlds. We do have some idea why states, religions, laws, sciences, political parties, languages, etc. came into being, and there's no point in pretending that we don't. But we also have built into our individual consciousnesses a highly cultivated capacity to discount the information being fed to us by the outside world. We are able to detect information that lacks value or is an outright hoax. We might say that we have a reasonably keen sense that the world's pre-packaged forms are not part of a fixed game. But where did this keen sense come from? Nature. Animals, birds, insects have to closely monitor signals from their environment to survive and arising out of the close monitoring is a certain capacity for detecting and peddling false information. And more on this in due course. But humans as a species on the trajectory to being the world's most successful predator have gained a special purchase on this topic, especially with the advent of language. History doesn't record whether the first hominid to use language was the first to realize its potential for deceit, but if not him, it can't have taken too long before another member of this species did. And it is one of the tasks for this talk to point out that the advent of the Greeks represents another special moment in the discernment and practice of deception. The ancient Greeks, it should be noted, since we are talking about definition, gave us the term irony. The word aeron means, as any Greek dissonary will tell you, a dissembler. So aero to talk, aeron, the one who talks. Yes, at a literal level, quite simply, the talker. But by an extension of meaning that's really easy to imagine, the one who does too much talk, the fast talker, the smooth talker, the voluble person. When you get too good at it, you can use language not for its original purpose to make true statements about the world for the mutual benefit of socially inclined individuals, but to obtain some personal benefit. And at a certain point, even the average person must realize this. When that point is reached, you have arrived at that stage of civilization which has a conception of aeronea. And let's just say a little more in this etymological interlude. Notice a curiosity of the Greek language, to eros, wool. And notice a corresponding curiosity of the English language, the word yarn. The noun and verb spin and the expression to pull the wool over somebody's eyes. These usages have in common the notion of the complete opposite of some first purpose for language, namely the purpose of expounding information accurately. They all speak of the idea of the cover-up. Now, these usages could just be the result of accidental similarity. But the trouble with this is that they all fit too well with a widely held and widely understood idea that language can function as an instrument to block truth and therefore be empty. And the word talk itself can convey this pejorative meaning, especially when it's lined up against real activity. So that's just all talk. Less talk and more action. He talks a good game. So in summary, in some primary sense, irony is about empty formulations. But as we have just mentioned, the empty forms long predate the Greeks. And let us now turn to their real origins, 
The World of Nature. Part two, the biology of imitation. For many plants, animals and birds, looking like, sounding like, behaving like, and in some cases smelling like, or having the same pheromones as other entities in the natural world can bestow evolutionary advantage. Let's do a brief survey of these, starting with plants. One, the bee orchid. It's an orchid that looks like a bee. Male bees are attracted to it, they attempt to copulate with it, fail and then spread its pollen. One of the photos on the laminated card gives what might be called a bee's eye view of the orchid. The male bee sees the orchid in, say, a light breeze, and it looks to him like the generously proportioned queen bee flying on her so-called nuptial flight. Not notice just a bee sitting on a flower. It's also worth noting that the male bee doesn't have much chance of avoiding, quotes, making his mistake, because the flower looks like a female bee, has the velvety textured flanks of the female bee, and smells like a female bee. So the deception is on a grand scale. Two, the western skunk cabbage plant. It emits a disgusting odour to attract pollinators. The scavenging flies and beetles think they have found a nutritious pile of rotting vegetation. Three, the living stone plant. It is a plant that looks like a round blue-gray stone, so grazers don't eat it. Four, the dead nettle. This plant looks like the poisonous nettle, so again, grazers don't eat it. And finally for plants, number five. This is an example of special interest because it involves the meddling of human beings. Rye. Rye is a crop that looks in some measure like wheat. Even though the evolution of rye is controversial, the going view is this. Over thousands of years, Neolithic man dug out 90 to 95% of the weeds in their crop that didn't look like wheat. There remained, however, 5% of the weed that had some characteristic that made it resemble wheat. These varieties of, I can't believe it's not wheat, started to cross fertilize to produce the hardy, low nutritional rye crop that exists today. Rye is used for flour, rye bread, rye beer, some whiskies, some vodkas, and rolled oats. It is grown mainly in Europe and Euro-Asia, especially in areas of poor soils and harsh winters, with some farmers growing it exclusively as a winter crop. And sometimes just for animal fodder. So now, mimicking animals. Just some quick examples. Case number one, the black and white banded non-poisonous eel, the harlequin snake eel. It derives evolutionary benefit from being strikingly similar in appearance to the poisonous sea snake, the sea crate. Two, there are certain moths that are the same color as the trees they characteristically land on. Three, the intriguing case of the cuckoo, which places its own egg in the nest of a dupe bird. Four, and this is a topic of particular interest for us, certain animals are able to play dead, i.e. they're able to imitate a dead version of themselves. Some of these imitations can be quite spectacular. The animal is able to freeze in strange attitudes. And this is often accompanied by defecation or the exuding of noxious smells or poisons to enhance the appearance of being dead and therefore to enhance its unattractiveness to a pursuing predator. Okay, that's a little conspectus on mimicry in nature. But before we move on, let's make sure that one thing is clear about these many examples, namely that they involve a completely natural process. 
the evolutionary advantage derives from merely looking like something else. No agency needs to be attributed to the plant or animal. No cunning has to be ascribed to it. Not even any volition need be ascribed, as in the bee orchid is trying to look like a bee. In other words, the term mimic is a rather annoying misnomer. The symbiosis, the correct word, springs up in a completely natural way over time. Some moths happen to look like a tree they were landing on. The rest are picked off by predators. The moths that looked a bit like the tree bred with the moths that actually closely resembled the tree and then in a process of refining based on not being identified as prey, you end up with the whole species looking exactly like the tree. Another thing that we need to mention is that it's not entirely clear which of the symbiotics is doing the mimicking. Say you have 25% harlequin eels and 75% sea crates. The eel is advantaged because the fish world interprets the two symbiotics as dangerous. When you have 75% harlequin eels and 25% sea crates, the sea snake is advantaged because the fish world is interpreting the two symbiotics as harmless, leaving the sea crate with suitable prey fish paying little attention to it. Advantage to the sea crate. So there is a peculiar promotion of each other's careers going on based merely on resemblance and a principle in evolution on which Darwin left us uninstructed. Survival of the similar. What remains to be commented on here is the case of the animals that play dead. Let's begin with the concept tonic immobility. Everyone is familiar with the cases of cats and dogs where the mother lifts up kittens, cubs, pups, by the scruff of the neck. The infant animal, quotes, goes limp. In other words, leaves off struggling and relaxes all its muscles. This is a completely reflex action and exists widely in nature. There are, for instance, the intriguing cases of many types of fish doing this. Sharks and stingrays are well-known examples. Killer whales deliberately try and turn great white sharks and stingrays, stingrays over onto their backs to induce a tonic immobility reflex and then kill them or wait for them to suffocate. It's thought that the cat that plays with a mouse before killing and eating it is not doing so out of something humans call cruelty, but rather because it is conducting tests on the mouse's tonic immobility responses. It seems that the famously cleanliness conscious feline doesn't wish to be suddenly covered in feces. Also, the cat has learnt from lizards, snakes, toads, etc., that its prey can perform other noxious emissions while being threatened with ingestion as part of their tonic shutdown. Perhaps of even greater interest is that we have a tonic immobility response. In recent times, there have been studies on, believe it or not, mass shooting victims, which have made an interesting and clear finding. The survival rate of people who play dead when being usually randomly shot at is much higher than those who flee. Apparently the shooter doesn't want to waste bullets on those that are probably already dead and perhaps in a state of agitation is only really looking for moving targets. This brings us to our second category, thanatosis, playing possum or playing dead. This is really a separate topic. The people who fall over immobile in a mass shooting are doing so reflexively from the trauma. Only a very small proportion play dead, having thought, 
well, if a disgruntled employee ever turns up here and starts shooting, then I'm going to play dead. Apparently people are not so determinedly re resolved. And in mass shootings, those who are falling down immobile do so reflexively. In thanatosis, however, a decision by the animal is involved. It detects serious danger. It knows it has an immobility defense available to it. So it consciously freezes. In some cases, turning off its own metabolism can make a prey animal hard or even impossible for its predator to detect. The prey animals of snakes, including other snakes, frequently behave in this way. With no thermal life signs, the pursuing snake simply fails to locate them. Here is a brief list of, list of animals that are able to perform thanatosis. Snakes, hamsters, possums, lizards, beetles, wasps, crickets, spiders. Notice that before we depart from categories one and two, that the first is a reflex. The second is an adaptive behavior. But over long periods of time, the adaptive behaviors must have created the reflexes. And reflexes can end up being involved in the adaptive behaviors. One example. The bitch dog in a wild dog pack, say the alpha female, when disapproving of the behavior of her or a young, young dog, at first stares at the dog to achieve discipline, but might go on to a second stage of rushing at it and grabbing it by the scruff of the neck. Even though the juvenile dog is no longer a puppy, she can still achieve the tonic immobility response. And even if it doesn't quite work, the disciplining mother still gets across the message, remember how I used to be in charge? Well, I still am. So there the reflex is being brought back into the adaptive behavior. Also, anyone who has seen cats copulating will know that the tom tries to grab the scruff of the female's neck to affect compliance. So in summary, on our categories one and two, there are mechanisms in nature which involve a type of automatic catatonia. And within these behaviors, there is a certain fluidity between reflexes and adaptive behaviors. Now to our categories three and four and to the tricky case of human beings and certain questions of abnormal psychology. Category three, peritraumatic dissociative reaction. Controversially in violent abuse and rape victims, but more widely associated with any number of severe psychological traumas. The multiple personality is one of these. This phenomenon has made a number of appearances in art. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The book and movie, The Three Faces of Eve, and more recently in the TV show, The United States of Tara. Also in this category is the fugue state, or dissociative amnesia. This is likewise something of a favorite idea in TV shows and movies. But by far the most famous case from real life is that of the murder mystery writer Agatha Christie, who disappeared in December of 1926, just when she was becoming famous. She turned up in a hotel quite some distance from where she lived and denied to her dying day, and she lived to be 85, that she had any idea where she had been for the 11 day period. The point I wish to make about this strange condition is that in the past, the dissociative identity disorder was considered to be just another of the mental illnesses like schizophrenia, depression, psychopathy, etc. However, about 20 years ago, this view changed completely. It is now thought that the dissociative reaction is an epiphenomenon, so a condition on top of another one. The dissociative reaction occurs when somebody with another mental condition or other conditions has had enough and just flips out into another personality. 
it's not thought that this is something the person has decided to do, it's rather in the nature of a reflex response. The trauma of their ongoing mental illness proves too much and some sort of genetically programmed fail-safe reaction becomes operative. Category four, learned helplessness. This is a very controversial category as abnormal psychology, but it is theorized that some sort of reflexive and genetically based learned helplessness reaction is playing a role in the rather peculiar phenomenon of clinical depression. So in summary, it is highly likely that these four phenomena are all connected to one another. Our current knowledge doesn't allow us to say exactly what the connections are, specifically with regard to human neurology. But I think there is enough here to help us with certain aspects of stage performance and the peculiarities of the Greeks. But before we go to that, we need to say something about another special feature of the natural world and give one last theoretic of importance for our biological argument. Irony as a predator's intuition and a related matter, the special role of predators in biodiversity. Firstly, irony as a predator's intuition and strategy. In the great dance of nature, where multicellular and complex creatures have to continually deal with each other, there arise certain predator-prey relationships. Primarily, the prey animals only need a food source, a mouth, and an alimentary canal. For the predators, on the other hand, life is never going to be so simple. They have a potential food source, and they have been equipped for predatory attack, but they face one big problem that never goes away, propinquity. Predators have to get up close and personal with their dinner dates. Because the prey animals have ways of evading and warning each other of attack, the pressure is continually on the predator to try and look like something else, to disappear into its background. The lioness is the color of the savannah into which she is trying to blend and she is able to flatten her ears to do so. Panthers are the color appropriate to nighttime predation. Crocodiles look like drifting logs. Snakes can be mistaken for vines and sticks and are designed to slither between cracks and crevices. Various predators are aware of their own scent and know to station themselves downwind of their prey. And in an unusual form of blending in, some predators are able to perform their own playing dead tricks. Not to escape anything, but to attract incautious scavengers. The aggressive and territorial cichlid famously turns itself side on and changes its color to look as if it's dead at the bottom of the ocean in order to attract scavengers. Now to our second issue, biodiversity. Zoologists and ethologists are quite clear about the salvational role predators play in an ecosystem. They are generators of biodiversity. How come? The prey animals only need a food source and a little bit of territory to survive in. They eat more and more and over generations get bigger and bigger and become more numerous and eventually, in theory, come to a point where they have eaten everything. Predators not only do the world a favor by preventing this, they also have the salutary effect of making the prey animals adopt a number of defensive tactics to match the various shifts that they, the predators, use as they pretend to be part of the scenery. This generates a situation where all manner of specialized exploitations of the environment need to be adopted by both prey and predators alike. And this in turn militates against the danger of a monochrome world where one single and even fairly trivial disaster would be enough to bring about a complete ecological collapse or in an extreme scenario, 
be enough to bring all complex life to an end. Now, what has all this got to do with the Greeks? Let's have a look. Part three, the biophysics of Greece. What is the distinctive feature of the biophysics of Greece in the evolution of civilization? Answer, it has a southern circumbuffering sea, the Mediterranean, keeping it at a remove from the older civilizations. It is this single fact that we assert has had profound consequences for the evolution of humans in the southeast corner of Europe. To explain this in a bit more detail, the southern and eastern well-established civilizations of, for instance, Egypt, Babylon or Assyria, weren't ever able to interact with the Greeks in the usual way that civilized centers deal with their periphery. Usually the civilization is rather closely locked into a symbiotic relationship with the troublemaking predatory tribesmen of its peripheral area. The civilization functions quite a bit like prey with its insatiable consumption of and desire for more and more resources. The puzzled tribesmen of the periphery, whilst being annoyed by the resource plunder of the civilizers, see in this development interesting opportunities for themselves and periodically invade the civilization and in doing so act just like predators. So, over the hundreds of years in which Egypt is a grand and significant civilization, it is never in a position to say run an army up around here and into the southeast of Europe. And likewise, the Mesopotamian powers have trouble extending their influence beyond, first of all, the Taurus Mountains, and then secondly, the Aegean Sea. A situation that only changes and tellingly results in failure at the beginning of the 5th century BC when the Persians attempt it. As a result of all this, Greece became over many hundreds of years a, so to say, outcrop of periphery. And once a certain level of rivalry was reduced to a point where civilization of a sort could actually obtain there, the Greeks found themselves in an odd situation a whole society of predators having to live together cheek by jowl. So that's the general picture of the emergence of Greece. But let's see if we can be a bit more specific. At the end of the Bronze Age, around 1200 BC, there is what seems to be a period of complete chaos in the Eastern Mediterranean. A whole area is suffering something somewhat intriguingly called a systems collapse. Nobody really knows why. The aftermath of earthquake activity seems to be a number one possibility. We know from pharaonic monuments that mysterious invaders, the Sea Peoples, are on the move and are even attacking Egypt itself. The situation in Greece looks something like this. From 1200 on, the population on the mainland starts to decline, but from 1100 on, it starts to plummet, only bottoming out in 950. Two interesting details here. One, it is thought that the population drop between 1200 and 950 is in the order of 90%, and two, that between 1100 and 900, the whole region of Laconia, i.e. the southern Peloponnese, has no population at all. In the period 950 to 850, however, the population starts to increase, and from 850 on, the rate of increase is well above anything that is usual for antiquity. Clues to the speed and significance of the recovery come in the 8th century with the adoption of Phoenician script. And a notable coincidence, 
the appearance of a 24 book poem in Greek, the Iliad, an epic which very tellingly makes the case that the chieftains of mainland Greece are in a position to take on over a long period the entity Troy, which according to me is a symbol for those serious civilizations of the Southeast. Another clue to the recovery is the institution of the Olympic Games, the traditional date for which is 776. And that's not all. In this 8th century period, the newly prosperous Greeks, who, at least in my understanding, are small-scale farmers and traders who are able to switch over to being warrior sailors when required, get nearly full control of Sicily. The date is around 750 BC. Eventually, however, in a period of history that's hard to accurately piece together, the Greeks, or more particularly the Athenians, become, so to say, accidental imperialists. They are people who build up the loosest of all imperialisms, a sea empire, which by the fifth century stretches from the Black Sea up north and Pamphylia down south, all the way through to Sicily. The point I'm hoping to make with this outline of history is this. The period starts with a socio-political trauma of a magnitude that's hard to imagine and eventually gives way to a rebound for a group that we will describe as hardy predator survivors. But in the period 850 through to the time of the Athenian Empire, as our traumatized hardy predator survivors attempt to become an epicenter for a civilization of a sort, their problem of being predators who have to act against type as civilizers is only going to get worse. This is the backdrop to what happens in art. In the 8th century, the 24 book poem, The Iliad, is already a clue to the dissociative reaction that we are arguing for. The idea of a major artwork is itself dissociative, i.e. let's forget about reality and just immerse ourselves in hours of art. But it's the content of this particular work that provides the real key to the problem of the Greeks as predators. The expressing of aggression. The story of the Greeks at Troy is, leaving aside the issue of the gods seeming to be overly fond of protecting the Trojans from their fate, one of the Greeks being their own worst enemy. In the first sentence, we are told that the topic is going to be the wrath of the principal fighter Achilles. The problem right from the start is that the principal fighter, because of his wrath, won't fight. This is owing to a dispute over a woman. Then the problem becomes that the Greeks are about to lose. So Achilles, who still can't be convinced to fight, sends his offside Patroclus out as a sort of proxy for himself. Patroclus, who up to this point has been painted as the most docile of homebodies, after some successes, seems to go berserk in the fighting and is killed by Apollo. This creates an even more furious Achilles who now joins the war. And then matters sail on to a complete stalemate to round out the 10 year period of earlier stalemates, but with the rather suggestive ending of the games at Patroclus' funeral. The text seems to be saying that these people would be better off playing games than wars. And since the Olympic games is being is beginning in the 8th century at the same time that the Iliad is being written down, that seems a fair interpretation. But the expending of energy and the fun of games are not enough. And the fictive Greeks of the Iliad and the real Greeks living in the 8th century, both find themselves experiencing the existential problem that I call the predator's nightmare. 
And what is that nightmare? Having to deal and cooperate with other predators. The predators who have gotten nowhere at Troy need to do what all predators under pressure have to do. They have to change tack. Enter irony. Part four, the coming of ironic man, the odyssey through to the Greek plays. Out on the internet of today is an intriguing factoid. 80% of the world's population doesn't get irony. It's a claim supposedly based on neuroscience. What does the claim actually mean? Probably something like this. 80% of people take the world at face value. This is not to say that people don't know what a lie is. It's got to be something much more profound than that. Perhaps this. Vast numbers of people are incapable of seeing the behavior of humans as a game playing activity. Taking our line from the two monumental and culture defining poems of Greek antiquity, the Iliad and the Odyssey, we might, on the basis of the textual split between those two texts, say that 80% of people have an Iliadic conception of the world and 20% an Odyssaic one. The Iliadics see the world as having something like the stresses and strains that exist between the Archaeans and the Trojans in the poem. It's a vision of a gigantic agon between haves and have-nots, between civilization and periphery, between city and country. The Odysseics have a vision that is a sort of verso of this phenomenon. The world conceptualized ironically. They don't see a world where people are proudly grandstanding and challenging one another on the open field of battle, whether metaphysical or otherwise, as in the Iliad. Instead, they see a world where there are nearly unlimited possibilities for people to adopt elaborate strategies in order to scam one another, a world where people can carry out various parasitic activities. Parasitic not really being a pejorative term here such as scouring the Mediterranean for free lunches and free everything else in polite or pseudo polite or even rudely impolite visiting. Or of course, just pretending to be other people in order to insinuate yourself to do those same things. The big break between the two poems for the way I'm describing them takes place outside the two texts of the Iliad and Odyssey, the wooden horse episode. This is the defining fictive moment for all Greek culture. Let's call it the biggest empty form scam in literature. The Greeks, having finally worked out that their superior military prowess will not result in them taking Troy, devise a scheme. They will use a wooden horse as a fake gift to get some men into Troy. In the metaphysics of the struggle between Greece and Troy, the peripherals, the Greeks, through the device of a fake horse, are attaining civilization. And so it was, according to our argument today, that in the seventh century, the Greek mind came to the conclusion that empty forms are the path to evolutionary success. This idea is pointedly taken up in the Odyssey where there is an almost exclusive focus on one man, Odysseus, an exemplum for Greek cunning and someone who is retrospectively turned into the smartest man at Troy. In the story, Odysseus is struggling to make it back home from Troy to his fiefdom in Ithaca. As the story rolls on, we find out that his tutelary or guiding deity, Athena, his wife and his son are likewise cunning game playing performers. Most people are familiar with the cases of Odysseus pretending to be no man and a Cretan who's on the run and of Penelope deceiving the suitors by unpicking her weaving and later testing Odysseus with the story about the bed needing to be moved. But I would like to dwell on some examples of Telemachus. 
as he is shown taking up his career as a true Greek man, as a true son of his father and mother, as an Aaron. Before we get to those examples, let's see the set the scene for the situation that emerges in books 16 through to 21. The way the story is told, it's made quite clear that if Odysseus had not turned up when he did, Telemachus coming to maturity and starting to assert himself in his own household would have been killed or in some way removed by the suitors. And Penelope, seeing Telemachus now at the age of being inclined to bristle at the presence of the suitors, consuming Odysseus's and now his own patrimony, would have arranged the contest for her marriage and gone off with one of the suitors. So it is part of the just in the nick of timery of the story that Odysseus arrives home to steer Telemachus in the correct ironic direction. But there is a sort of turn in the otherwise fixed narrative of the story that we've just outlined, which is that Telemachus, without much instruction, proves to be very much his father's son and is very quickly an expert Aaron. So let's see this in action. The first piece of advice that Odysseus gives Telemachus with regard to their whole Aaronic enterprise is that should the suitors start to attack his beggar in rags with cripples walking stick persona in the palace, Telemachus must not react. First rule for the dissociative strategy is to play dead. And so it is here as outlined by Odysseus. Don't react in a normal way to the provocations of the suitors. 16, 274 to 277. And Telemachus gets a second instruction from Odysseus. Take down the armor and arms in the hall. And when the suitors ask what you've done, lead them astray with a soft answer. 16, 283 to 287. Namely, that you don't want them to come to any harm by engaging in any rash behavior whilst under the influence of drink. Those two things are not much for Telemachus to go on as he joins in what seems to him his father's ambitious plan to kill the perhaps hundred suitors. But you'll notice that as soon as he returns home for the implementation of Odysseus's plot of insinuating himself into his own palace disguised as a beggar, Telemachus starts to perform as an Aaron on autopilot. Example one. This is the moment when the principal suitor Antinous upbraids Eumaeus, the good swineherd, for bringing the filthy beggar to the house to devour his master's substance. And Telemachus interrupts Antinous's rather too energetic defense with this. 17397. How you take thought for me, Antinous. Father with son could be no kinder. This is an interesting case of irony because it functions as a counter irony. Telemachus is giving false thanks to a suitor who has just shown a fake concern for the welfare of the household patrimony. Example two. In this scene, Telemachus addresses the Odysseus persona in the hearing of the suitors about the fight to take place between the persona and the young vagrant Eris, assuring him that none of the suitors will, showing favoritism for Eris, strike him during the fight. Telemachus concludes his assurance with 1864-65. I am your host, and here are two princes to support me. Antinous and Eurymachus, men of good judgment both. Pepnumino ampho. This is a rather typical case of irony. In the usual ironic situation, the plotter says less than he means. 
but taken to its logical conclusion, saying less can end up being saying the opposite of what is meant. Example three. Here Penelope reprimands Telemachus for allowing the beggar, Eris, to come to harm under their roof. And in response, Telemachus tries an unusual species of irony where he tells the shocking truth about what he wants to see happen to the suitors as a sort of feeble excusing for his failure to do anything. 18.227.239 Thoughtful Telemachus answered her, Mother, I do not resent your indignation, yet I do take note and pay heed to things, the good and the bad as well, before I was still a child. But I cannot contrive everything wisely, because here on each side of me I find these men with their evil schemes. They dismay me, and I have no helpers. Yet after all, the fight between Iris and the stranger did not go as the suitors wished and the stranger proved the better man. In the name of Zeus and Athena and Apollo, I only wish that at this instant, the suitors here, whether out in the courtyard or in the hall, had such battered bodies and rocking heads and fainting limbs as Iris there at the courtyard gates. The irony here is a contextual one. He's saying the truth, but the suitors couldn't care less about the beaten up vagrant. And Telemachus's provocative wish that he wants to kill them is just treated by them as an adolescent embroidery of a rather weak excusing. It should also be pointed out here that in rhetoric, and later we will say something about the connection between irony and rhetoric, there is a strategy of using the surprising assertion or the astonishing claim, which at the very least grabs the audience's attention. But then after giving some context with a little bit of verbal fancy footwork, the speaker shows the claim to be quite a bit less shocking. Example four, 20, 129 to 133. Dear nurse, what care did you women show to the stranger in this house? Did you give him the food and bed he deserved? Or has he been left to lie uncared for? That is my mother's way, understanding though she is. She goes by impulse, making much of a man who is unworthy and sending his better away unhonored. This is quite a strange species of irony. Telemachus wants to dress up his concern for his father's treatment during the night in the palace by ascribing to his mother misguided whims for sheltering the unworthy. You could read this as simple sexism or as simple motherism, but since it's being directed toward Eurycleia with no suitors present, it's really his own invention. It's a blending in device to make him look like a regular squire with nothing more than low level concerns about who's being fed what. Last example, number five. The contest of the bow is just about to be set up in the hall and Telemachus blurts this out. 21, 102 to 105. Then Prince Telemachus spoke among them. This is a strange thing. Surely the son of Cronos has taken my wits away. My own dear mother, for all her wisdom, is saying now she will leave this house in another's company. Yet here I am, thoughtlessly laughing and making merry. This is now the ascription to whim of whimsicality and lightheadedness to himself. Here we see that Telemachus has become a virtuoso Aaron. He's come a long way in a short time. This is exactly how an Aaron should behave to put his potential victims off their guard. Pretend to be crazy. And then his next crazy step is to grab the bow, be the first to try it, and then, ultimate irony, pretends to fail to achieve the stringing, concluding with this thickly ironical speech, 
21 131 to 135. Alas, it seems for all my days I must be spiritless and a weakling. Or it may be that I'm only too young, still unable to trust my hands for self-defense when a man picks a quarrel with me. Come then, you whose powers are far above mine, make your own trial of the bow. Let us bring this contest to an end. So in summary, the Odyssey is charting the emergence of ironic man in the person of Odysseus. Odysseus's ironic infrastructure of Athena, Penelope, and Telemachus allows for a widening of the focus on this new type of heroism. And in the specific case of Telemachus shows that there is a bright future for ironic deceptions. Now, very briefly on Greek plays. From the eighth to the fifth centuries, the problems of Greeks stitching together a civilization with nothing other than a plethora of predators only increase. In these four centuries, Greece, and more particularly Athens, becomes an actual empire. With this development comes a cultural eruption of world significance mass attendance at stage performances where all manner of ironic performances on show. It starts on the stage in the most logical way imaginable. The predators who used irony to win at Troy become the victims of a second wave of predators who use irony against them. So in one of the early Athenian plays or trilogy of plays, the Oresteia, Clytemnestra gets revenge on her husband Agamemnon, the commander of the Greeks at Troy, for his perceived misdemeanors before and after the war. And Orestes, their son, gets revenge on her. A scene from the Libation Bearers might help us out here. The Libation Bearers is the middle play of this early trilogy. In it, Orestes comes to the palace of Aegisthus and Clytemnestra, playing a traveler, acting as a messenger who has been asked to pass on the news of Orestes' death. Got that? Clytemnestra, perhaps on a balcony to the palace, says, oh, that's terrible. And then the messenger persona says this, 685 to 692, if only I were my friends, with coasts as fortunate as you, if only I could be known for better news and welcomed like a brother. The tie between the host and stranger, what is kinder? But what an impiety, so it seemed to me, not to bring this to a head for loved ones. I was bound by honor, bound by the rights of hospitality. To this, Clytemnestra says, Oh, sure, you can come in. Orestes' lines are full of the double talk that becomes typical in ironic performances. To get himself into the palace, he has to hint that he, the messenger, has done them an honorable favor by bringing the news. But his words read like an indictment against Clytemnestra for her lack of hospitality in murdering her own husband in his bath. As we move into the period of the high point of the Athenian Empire, the ironic plotting simply increases. So by the time we get to a play like Euripides' Ion, we have a stage situation where all manner of plots are being hatched. Basically, everyone is plotting against everyone else, or at the very least withholding information from them. And it's not just the irony that increases in this period. The number of plays and performances are steeply on the rise. According to my own quick study of Greek playwrights in the 5th, 4th and 3rd centuries, for whom we've got reliable figures, on average, each of these playwrights is turning out 53 plays. I'll just remind you that Aeschylus wrote between 70 and 90, Aristophanes 40, Euripides 63, Sophocles 123. This is a cranking out of dramas on an industrial and Hollywoodic scale. Part five, 
the specific moment of ironic performance coming onto the stage. So far in this talk, we've given the background circumstances of a surge in irony in 7th century Greece that becomes a torrent in the 5th. But what we haven't explained is how precisely the stage presentation of irony actually began. The going view of the emergence of drama has been furnished by the anthropologically minded classicists, Gilbert Murray and Francis Cornford, studying respectively tragedy and comedy a hundred years ago. According to them, drama emerged out of religious ritual. So tragedy was in an earlier time born of some kind of ritual acting out of, say, a dying, an ailing or otherwise polluted king, or a ritual which dealt with a redemption or expiation attending the slow dying, the ailing or the being polluted. And comedy was born of fertility ritual. Even though this must have been the case, it doesn't help us at all with the problem of where ironic performance came from. For that, we need to go back a bit more than another hundred years to an early romantic, the philosopher Friedrich Schlegel, and his much quoted definition, irony is a permanent parabasis. With this, Schlegel might have been seeing into the problem a bit more deeply than anybody before or since. Irony is an interruption. It's an interruption to a fixed narrative of what is supposed to happen. This even applies to the popular conception of irony. Our Lady Who Hated Men is a good example. The fixed narrative of her life was that she apparently spent every single second of it hating men. Then something happened. Or another piece of information is introduced. In this case, she married one of the groups that she, one of the group that she's supposed to be hating and a shadow now descends on that entire superstructure or narrative. It becomes an emptied out form. Did she ever really hate men? But how does this apply to Greek art? Well, let's first clear up what a parabasis is. Parabasis is para besides with bino to go. It is a going besides. In Greek art is usually thought of, it's thought to refer to the chorus and their commentary on events in a play, but can also refer to a moment such as occurs in Aristophanes the Arcanians, where the lead character, Nicaeopolis, possibly Aristophanes himself, addresses the audience about the trouble he got into putting on the previous year's play, getting sued by the politician Cleone. 3772382. The permanent parabasis can help us understand how ironic performances come about. Not just the rather deep but correct notion that the play itself is an interruption to everyday life, where actors and audiences all flip out from everyday reality and live in a make-believe world, but that the dramatic action is an interruption, is itself, as per our theoretic, dissociative. So the first actor ca that came onto the stage was himself, the parabasis. Later on, there are two or three actors. As the audience, let's call them the predators of Athens, want more and more ironic performance. But right at the beginning, the first actor was an interruption of the ritual dancing and singing of the chorus. What the chorus was doing was almost certainly already dissociative. We might get a line on this by thinking about our very own Australian Aborigines and their dances, where the performers pretend to be kangaroos, brolgas, lyrebirds, etc. But at a certain point in Greek ritual, this must have taken a more profound turn, with a dredging up of the traumas of the past and memories of a troubled hero king, an Achilles a Hercules, an Ajax, etc., who stepped forward onto the stage to state their gripe and to reveal their plot. In support of this, just one detail. In The Libation Bearers, as we've mentioned, an early play, the chorus completely against what happens with later choruses is in on the plot. 
and even participates in it. At a critical moment in the play, it is the chorus which advises a nurse in the palace that she should tell Aegisthus, Clytemnestra's new husband, that there is no need to bring his henchmen to see the recently arrived visitors. So, in short, the ironic impulse long predates the first person to step onto the stage. It goes back at least to the seventh century. But as our Greek predators become more and more successful and more numerous, and most importantly, packed into urban centers, the dissociative religious art of time immemorial takes on a new, more extreme form eventually exploding onto the stage where it very soon becomes the sole focus of interest. After not much more than a century, the chorus is done away with altogether, leaving only ironic performance. Part six, irony is the basis of all Greek culture. Seeing irony in a biological and therefore fundamental way as we've been attempting in this talk may help us to appreciate the way in which it informs the rest of Greek culture. Let's look at democracy, rhetoric and skeptical philosophy. Democracy is usually attributed to some such waffle as the great soul of the Greeks, or the clear, clean, sweet air of the Peloponnese and Attica. But it is really the result of the predator's nightmare. Democracy was not born of a great love of one's fellow man's opinions. It was born of a sheer white knuckle terror of one's fellow predators. In particular of bigger, better set up, and nastier predators than you. The distinctive feature of early Greek democracy was the ostracism. It's only after you've freed yourself of tyrants that you move on to espouse some interest in other people's social and political opinions. Rhetoric. Rhetoric is the predator strategy of blending in whilst taking over. What is the point of departure in all rhetoric? The humility of the speaker. Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, I come before you today, ladies and gentlemen, just an ordinary man with a few modest proposals. The second tactic for rhetoric, which grows out of the modesty, is saying less. It's a modest this, a minor that, a simple something else. Eventually, it's the slenderest imaginable claims of the latotes, not unattractive strategies, not entirely implausible claims, far from unreasonable approaches. And finally, in a very familiar irony, where you are saying less to the point of saying the opposite, it's the extreme rhetorical elegance of the entirely emptied out form. We've now lost all our battleships or money or credibility or bargaining power. Well, that's just great. He broke her heart. He took her money. He alienated the children. He's a real charmer. Finally, on rhetoric, we'll mention the special case of Socratic irony. This is the irony of the question asker. Pretending not to know the answer is just another humble speaker strategy, but it launches a very promising future direction. Into your web of ignorance by a line of suggestive questioning, you can lead your interlocutor into coming up with the answer you wanted in the first place, or at the very least, the slant of opinion you approve of. Skeptical philosophy. Skeptical philosophy goes beyond the issues of your fragile welfare while surrounded by predators in a dangerous polity and goes beyond the irony of Socrates and playing games with students. This is the giant discovery of the Greeks. By way of a total dissociative maneuver, you ponder a world where at some initial point, nothing is known. 
you set aside all your own views, all your own preconceptions, and you then think through the issues from the ground up. This is the beginning of science. Conclusion. In this talk, we gave a definition of irony. It's all about empty forms. These exist in nature and in fact afford us a glimpse of a successful evolutionary strategy, looking like other things. This is of vital significance for predators who have a never ending problem with regard to getting up close to their prey. They need to achieve a blending in, a looking like something harmless. The Greeks, owing to the geographical accident of being at a remove from the southern civilizations during the Bronze and Dark Ages, find themselves in an unusual situation that has reference to these blending in issues. They become an emergent, loosely affiliated imperialism of predators with no primary connection to their parent come prey southern civilizations and by degrees have the shocking realization that they are their own biggest nightmare. Their problem is evident as early as the 8th century BC with the Iliad, a symptom, and the Olympic Games, an attempted cure. There is too much aggression and not enough cooperation for civilized life. Nature, however, comes to the rescue with irony. In fiction, the breakthrough moment is the scamming of the Trojans with a gift horse, and then the realization that scamming is the only way forward from there on in. The Odyssey underlines the necessity of this strategy. It shows in action a dissociative cunning for survival in a world that's never really existed before. A world that has nothing to do with the timeless monumentality of Egypt and Babylon. As time moves on, a full-blown civilization comes to Greece and this creates an even greater need for ironic performance. In our version of events, irony just spills out from the traditional singing and dancing chorus, which was itself very likely moving towards greater dissociative ironies. At some unthinkable first moment in the 6th century BC, someone who perhaps looked or sounded like a Trojan story cycle bard, stepped forward to tell of his predicament and his plot to deal with it his plan to be the disturber of a fixed narrative universe. All this helps us to see something else, namely that irony equipped the Greeks for much more than drama. Through a pervasive irony induced nervous fear, they learn to adopt the least bad form of government for a generally refractory, non-quiescent horde of predators democracy. They learn the tactics of rhetoric for living amongst and persuading their fellow predators, and they learn extraordinarily through philosophy a type of thanatosis. They learn the value of extinguishing their own difficult and opinionated personalities to clear the way for skeptical arguments and real science. Thanks.